Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you um, someone who really is out there where the rubber meets the road trying to help folks with these substances even before it's officially permitted to do so. Um, this is Dimitri Mobengo Mugianis. And the Mobengo is an African middle name you've adopted in, G in Gabon, right? Yes. So uh, Dimitri not only works here in the States, but also goes to Africa and uh, participates in the ceremony and I believe has become very, a very serious devotee of, 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 the, um, of the Ibogaine religion. Um, uh, let me read to you his, his bio. Dimitri Mobengo Mugianis is a founding member of Freedom Root, the Ibogaine project. He's an Ibogaine treatment provider working in New York City and a Bwiti initiate uh, and Nagang Naganga. Naganga, thank you. Uh, Dimitri is co-founder of Vocal NYC, Drug Users Union, and has spoken around the world about drug users' uh, human rights, harm reduction, drug policy, and Ibogaine. Uh, he's been featured in numerous publications and media outlets, including the NPR's This Is American Life, and his work is the subject of an upcoming documentary by Michael Negroponte. Dimitri recently returned from his most recent trip to Gabon, Africa, where he participated in several Bwiti initiations in Pygmy, Fang, and Sogo villages using the sacrament of Iboga. Uh, he's a poet, musician, and lives in Brooklyn with his wife, Roman. It is my great pleasure to turn you over to Dimitri. Thank you. Um, let me start out the way we start out um, any sort of ceremony or gathering in, uh, in the Bwiti way, uh, a call and response. I say Bukai, you say yay, I say wane, excuse me, I say Bukai, you say I, I say wane, you say yay. Bukai! Wane! Base, base, base. Um, I'd like to thank the ancestors and the spirit of this plant and all the plants that have brought us here. Um, it's been a journey. I pour libations for the ancestors. This is gonna be a little different than everyone else here tonight. Um, I, I thank uh, Neil and the conference for having the courage to bring me up here in the field of all these PhDs and MDs. I think I'm the only GED here represented. Um, I'll just start out by giving you a basic overall. There's no studies that I'm involved in. This is just uh, drug user to drug user. Um, talk, start out by talking about who I was before Aboga. I started, I uh, came to New York uh, in the early 80s to be a poet and a musician and, you know, and I was experimenting with drugs and found myself uh, uh, seriously dependent on uh, cocaine, heroin, and methadone. Um, I lived for several years, my, my late wife and I with uh, Herbert Hunky. I don't, for those of you who know who Herbert Hunky was, the first person ever to shoot up William Burroughs, amongst other things. Um, so he was sort of a teacher of mine. And I became seriously dependent on, 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 uh, on drugs, on heroin and, and cocaine and methadone. And I, and I, I believe that, uh, that the poppy is a teacher plant and so is coca. I just learned my lesson and I couldn't get out of it. Um, after 20 years dependence, I went from being a musician and a poet, uh, living in New York to living in my parents' basement, turning 40, um, unable to find a vein, unable to basically do anything. I ceased being a, a, a writer. My whole focus was getting and acquiring drugs. My thirst, first thought in the morning was, was death, and my last thought at night was killing myself. I didn't see a way out. Over 20 years ago, through a friend of Herbert, a mutual friend, I heard about Ibogaine, the way a lot of uh, drug users hear about it. We were shooting up, and this guy, Adam, told me, a good friend of mine, um, that there was this thing that he did in Holland that got him off of drugs. He was doing this with a needle in his arm. But it was really an impact moment for me because I remembered it for the rest of my drug use. And I knew there was something out there because I tried everything else. I tried the replacement therapies, and they're good for some folks, they just didn't work for me. Basically, I'd go to the methadone clinic and shoot up in the parking lot. Um, it got to a point I'm Greek, you can tell by my middle name, Mubengo, it's a Greek name. Um, I'm Greek and I, my, my family was going back and forth to, forth to Greece and I never went and I had a physical hunger, which is curious because it was an ancestral hunger to go to Greece. I hadn't been in 30 years. And my only goal in doing Ibogaine was to, was to go to Greece, come back and continue dying. Um, the spirit of this plant and God, if you will, had another plan for me. 
I went, my family and friends raised money to get me to Holland. I went to Holland on 100 milligrams of, of methadone, about $200 to $150 worth of heroin, and enough cocaine to cause serious psychosis. I missed the psychosis, I guess, on my own. Anyways, I went and I ingested the, the, the sacrament of a boga for the first time in my life. And I, 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 I get emotional when I talk about this six years later because since I put that plant in my mouth, since I took the sacrament, my life has, has grown in ways that I, I can't believe. I can't believe I'm talking to y'all right now, you know? I took the plant, I was in Amsterdam, okay? I was in Mecca for heroin drug users and I had no desire to use heroin. I went through two incredible days where I saw visions that would come true five and six years later in the bush and on the streets of New York. I woke up without the desire to use and I just remember saying, praise God, I could not believe it. I went to Greece afterwards and for, I wanted to spend a month there, I spent three months there came back with the, with, the, with the passion of a zealot. I wanted to take this to my fellow drug users and let them know, to take it to the folks that didn't have a family, the folks that uh, may, might not be able to leave because of legal reasons or family issues, or the folks that couldn't leave New Orleans because they didn't have a bus fare. Um, so we started a couple years later. I, I, I worked every day. I just knew I was going to do this. And I met a guy named Eric Taub, who's done incredible work with Aboga. And we decided we're going to come to New York, come back to New York, and we we're going to treat 80 junkies in two months, and we're going to train 10 people, which was completely fucking crazy, okay? It was, in, it was, not, it was not doable. But what we did was we just went out, you know, with the... Um, with the enthusiasm of the ignorant, I guess. And we started passing out flyers in, in front of methadone clinics in Harlem, 125th and Park, and, and we started reaching out, and we started to do these treatments uh, on a sliding scale, user to user, and we learned as we went. We learned a lot. There was a guy named Freddie the Dealer. Freddie would pass out Ibogaine pamphlets when he sold heroin, and he was our first client. Um, and it was quite, quite a, a day. Uh, he was an alcoholic as well as a heroin addict, and he went into uh, the DTs right after the Ibogaine treatment. He, he, he went through the, the withdrawal from heroin, but he went into a convulsion. This was my first treatment, okay? He went into a convulsion, and I learned a lot. He didn't die. We got him to uh, St. Vincent's. He did great. He did great for several months until he started dealing again, but which brought us more clients, but that's a whole other story. Um, with Eddie, I realized that I had to step it up. I had to really ask people, the, the things that youth professionals do all the time, ask people the same questions in five and ten different ways. I, I have, that, that was about almost five years ago, and things have really changed. Um, we're still doing it on a sliding scale. We're still doing it in hotel rooms. We try not to do it in apartments anymore. I'm still meeting people in Washington Square and Union Square. That's where we do our intake. But we've learned a lot. Um, and one of the things that we've began to incorporate into, into this treatment is the use of Buiti, the technology of Buiti. I've been to uh, uh, Gabon now three times. And um, I have noticed that the technology involved with that, the things that the Buiti do, can help tremendously in this process. What do I mean? The Buiti is the original dance party, okay? We went there and we would initially have folks just lie in a dark room, we'd give them a, a, a um, small dose, see how it affects them, and then we would start to dose them as they got sick. Now we have music, Eddie the Dealer is now playing the harp, we're dancing, we're singing, um, the initiation, I've, bec I've been initiated, it has helped me understand the use of a boga. There's 20,000 years. This is something that we shouldn't ignore. There's 20,000 years of pygmy use of, of a boga and buiti. Um, I'm not an expert in buiti, but I can tell you a little bit about it. The pygmies have been eating a boga, the root, for over 20,000 years. And what happened is the Bantu people, who are the descendants of most African Americans, had come east. And they were agrarian people coming east looking for land. And they met the pygmies, and there were some of the same clashes that happened when agrarian people meet in hunter-gatherers, but there was the sacrament of a boga. And the folks that understood 
that they shouldn't exploit these people, the pygmies, were the folks that went in and started eating the sacrament of aboga and they developed uh, buiti. And there's a parallel between drug users doing it and oppressed colonial people doing it as well. 